Well, guys, it's exciting. We have um, Alan Hirsch with us today. Uh, he's so gracious to give us an interview. Uh, we're excited about this summer. Uh, just before we jump in, I want to tell you a little bit of, about him. Alan Hirsch is uh, the author of Forgotten Ways. He's the author of Read Jesus and Faithly. Um, he is the, the director of Forge Missions, which is a uh, organization that is dedicated to helping mega churches uh, really figure out how to live missionally, especially here in the, in the 21st century. Uh, he's an adjunct professor at Fuller Seminary, and uh, he's a thought leader and a, a sought-after speaker who's just dedicated, again, to helping us unpack uh, this um, the process of, uh, of just apostolic living and living missionally. So, um, Alan, thanks for, for uh, hanging out with us right now. Thanks, Byron. Good to be with you, brother. I just want to jump right in. Um, for, for several years now, you, you've been on this mission to, to help uh, as many people as you can, um, again, live missionally. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background and, and, and what really inspired you to really walk down this journey. Well, uh, I guess uh, our situations determine so much. Uh, I grew up in uh, racist South Africa. Uh, being on the margins and from a Jewish family, all this kind of like like shapes me. I I became a drug addict. I was one to the Lord on the edges of society, uh, with all the freaks and the weirdos and all that stuff. So I have always had an appreciation for the edges and and for the margins and uh, what God is doing there because He is working uh, among people like that all the time. So I think when I came to the Lord, I was already missionally wired in some ways because I my experience kind of lends itself to that. So I, you know, I've, I've I, I look for God at work in strange places, you know, outside the church as well as in. So uh, and then I, I was involved in a, a church, uh, leading a church in in Melbourne, Australia, for for many years, uh, which uh, was also a church that was trying to reach out to the all the various tribes and subcultures of the inner city Melbourne. And again, we were forced by circumstance to uh, drop the one-size-fits-all type approach that we normally take to issues of church in order to reach the incredible variety of people and different subcultures, gay, uh, some of the drug subcultures, youth subcultures, all that stuff that was going on in our little part of the world. And so we we were forced to adopt uh, you know somewhat of a missionary stance we were in like subcultural papua new guinea you know we had to become missionaries in our own backyard and and that fundamentally shifted me the other thing i would say that was worth uh, uh, in putting in here byron is that i um i was recruited to work for my denomination which is the same you know as the you know it's a restoration movement denomination uh, for about 12 years in various forms, but one of them was to lead our Department of Mission Education Development, which is like quite a serious job. And, and I guess uh, when you sit in that position and you, you look at the church and you look at the, the issues from a macro perspective, you realize that, you know, really our, our, our job is cut out for us in the Western world. We're on the back foot, losing ground in every Western context that we're aware of. And so, you know, the, all these things challenged me immensely to to think missionally, both in, in terms of my internal cultural programming, but also in terms of my experience in church, both in local and regional ministry. So, yeah, I guess that's you know where it comes from. And now that you've been um, in the states for a while, really helping uh, a lot of churches, I hear so many great things and um, the progress that's being made. I'm I'm so encouraged um, how the gospel is being spread um, here in America. <laughs> And um, but let me ask you this: uh, working with with different churches, what what do you see are some of the biggest hurdles that um, that, that churches face nowadays, uh, especially here in the states? Well, I think uh, you know, um, I think a lot of people are most progressive, and I mean by that, are most uh, are people in our churches most likely to respond to the missionary challenge, which calls for innovation, adoption of change. Um, um, you know, a willingness to kind of forego previous formulas that were formulated for different times and places uh, in order to search for new ways of doing and being church. I think that there's, there's, there's quite a lot of people in America that fit that bracket who are willing to kind of lean into it and to become all entrepreneurial again. Uh, and I, I tend to work with people like that. Um, but even so, when you're leading a complex or large system, you have to be very sensitive to issues of change management. 
partly because the paradigm of church that we've operated in for so long dominates the way we think about ourselves as God's people. If you reach back into the restoration movement itself, I mean, you, you look at it, it was early, it was a people movement. Uh, it never was meant to be a denomination. It was never meant to be run by heavies. And, you know, and, and it was actually quite a strong decentralized movement, which is really what we find in the pages of the New Testament and also in the other movements that really changed the world, like China, the, the Celtic uh, missionary phenomenon, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that, that uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is just be willing to let go in order to allow the possibility of new forms to develop. And not be too traditionalist about the forms of church. There's nothing sacred about the form of the church itself. Our job is to be a missionary agency for God's purposes in the world. And our job is to make sure that our organization reflects that in some way. And we've got to be constantly learning and constantly adapting. Uh, that's very good. How do you address then the, the, the question where maybe some pastors, uh, just traditionally, they're so used to getting people to, to come to church. They, they, they tell the congregation, uh, just, just invite your neighbors to church. Um, when, 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 when you're speaking with someone like that, um, who's just kind of been on the same tradition, I mean, what are some of the, the natural first steps that, that you might walk someone through? Well, for one, I mean, let's just reiterate that the way we engage generally, uh, when you say the come to us forms, what I call attractional forms, uh, pretty much have worked in, in the Western context for the last 17 centuries. Why? The assumption was that everyone's Christian already, or at least within the cultural orbit of the church. And so you didn't have to do serious mission work in order to engage people outside of the church, outside of the community. You just needed, they all spoke like us, and they were generically within the worldview that we all held. So. You can do attractional forms in that kind of setting. In a more missionary environment where people are alienated from the church and sometimes harbor antipathy towards the church, you can't simply adopt an attractional model. My challenge to a lot of leaders now is you've got to think both and. Keep doing what you're doing in America. There's still some legitimacy to the attractional form. I wouldn't deny it. But it's not enough to reach, I would argue, up to 60% of, of American population if you spread it out over the country. It's going to be different in different areas of the country, but if you spread it out, 60, maybe 50 percent of, um, of Americans who will n never come to your church, even in the best day you do it, you can have your most sexy Sunday service ever. And I, I, I think there's people in our culture now, our country, that are just not going to come, um, even on your best Sunday. And I, I think... In order to, to reach those people, you simply have to do it differently. And so one of my challenges uh, you know, to the church is learning what it means to be the church in the 60% who won't come. Asking what is church for them? What is good news for these people? It doesn't sound the same out there than it does in our standard kind of formats, our scripts that we kind of run to ourselves. So we need to uh, you know, find ourselves again in that setting and ask Allow the church to emerge as we engage in mission. Don't be too uptight about the forms, I say again. It's actually the forms will emerge. We say that do mission and the church comes out of the back of it. Mm, very good. A um, couple more questions. Uh, when churches are, are recognizing and, and embracing this uh, and both uh, philosophy, um, you know, it seems like the congregation is so used to, again, going to church, sitting down, and uh, listening to someone else tell them about, uh, about the Word, about, about God. Um, how does then a leader, because um, you mentioned change management, which I think is so important, um, how, how, does a, how does a leader navigate their, their staff and congregation through this reorientation um, that, that's, that's calling people to, to go out and, and be the church more um, within the context of, of, of their life? Well, I wrote a whole book on that, so you don't want the whole book. The book is called On the Verge, and I would recommend that people engage it um, because what is articulated there is a four-stage process, which we suggest, and I wrote it with Dave Ferguson, who's part of our movement. Uh, Dave and myself put together this, this four-stage process, what we call Imagine, which has to do with changing the way people think about the church and its functions, 
and that we need to reimagine different ways of being the church. And then the second stage is what we call shift, which involves a change process about developing a paradigm, creating a whole sets of ethos uh, that is built on the paradigm, and then whole lots of practices which people can do, and in doing them will be changed, uh, that are consistent with the paradigm. So that shift, and then we talk about innovate, learning how to kind of create new forms out of the box, not just simply reproduce what we know. And then the final one is what we call move or movementum, creating enough momentum to have a movement and keeping it going. So that's a whole, uh, keeping the kind of dynamic of fluidity and movement outwards. So, um, yeah, have a clear, clear understanding of what you want to end up like. And I would argue that you begin with the end of mind, but you also end with the beginning in mind as well. You have got to have a consistent philosophy of, of, of church as a movement and if, if you're going to be a movement. So um, that sounds a little technical. And I, again, I, I think it is, and there's no way beyond, uh, there's no simple three-step solution. I know that people crave for that stuff. I believe that the answer is there's no silver bullet, but there is a silver imagination. There's a, there's a way of thinking about ourselves that is potent beyond measure, and we need to rediscover it again in our day. I call it apostolic movement for what it's worth, but we need to rediscover what it means to be an apostolic movement again. So this summer, uh, Alan, you are going to be leading um, one of the, the major sessions at the NACC conventions. Um, a lot of people are looking forward to it. What can people expect uh, this summer in July? Well, I, I'm going to be talking about, um, uh, in line with kind of the theme of the, of the conference, uh, the idea of renewal and refreshment. So I'm going to say, I'm going to look at the kind of the, the most central thing that we need to do is to renew our relationship with Jesus, uh, re radicalize ourselves by going back to, to who Jesus was. This reflects another book I've written called Read Jesus, where we go back to Jesus to line ourselves up with him, you know, to, to say if what we're doing here, line up with who he is, what he said, uh, what he envisaged for the church, and if it isn't, we need to adjust ourselves. We don't adjust Jesus to suit us. We adjust the church to suit Jesus. And, and out of that, I'm going to look at re-disciples, so the issue of discipleship and, and how important and critical it is in our day to have formation processes, uh, helping people be formed in the way of Jesus Christ. Alan, thank you so much. Uh, we're definitely looking forward to, um, to seeing you uh, out in at the convention in July. So again, uh, thank you so much for the interview, and we'll see you then. Okay. Peace and mercy. See you then. Mm -hmm.